So, thanks for inviting me to speak today. The focus of this um, session between Linda and myself is going to be on smoking in enclosed spaces, and the data that I'll present um, relies very heavily on the results that have been generated by other people in this room, and you'll hear in more detail some of these um, results later today, I imagine. Um, before I start, there's a very brief disclosure in relation to my work with a couple of pharmaceutical companies that manufacture smoking cessation products, but it doesn't have any direct bearing on what I'll be talking about. Uh, much of what I'll show in terms of data will be familiar to many people here, I imagine. We know why people smoke. We, they smoke principally for the nicotine in cigarettes, and they smoke in a way which um, illustrates very clearly that their behaviour is under a strong degree of biological control via that nicotine. So on the left-hand side, you see a stylized representation of nicotine levels in a dependent smoker over the course of a day. They wake up in the morning with almost no nicotine in their system because nicotine is cleared very quickly. They smoke their first cigarette of the day. They get a very marked um, nicotine spike. That then begins to clear again because nicotine is cleared rapidly and in a couple of hours they start to feel withdrawal symptoms, have to go outside, have their cigarette, top themselves up again. And so over the course of the day, their um, nicotine levels are uh, punctuated by these spikes, but what they're trying to do is just maintain background levels of nicotine. And then they fall asleep, nicotine is cleared, and the cycle starts again. And on the right-hand side, you can see some data that Anne and I published a couple of years ago showing just how strongly behaviour can be controlled by this um, desire to maintain background levels of nicotine. Um, at the bottom, at the top rather, you see um, exposure to um, tobacco-specific nitrosamines, the harmful constituents of tobacco smoke, against on the x-axis the nicotine content as um, seen on the side of a pack, and you can see that there's almost no relationship. And the reason for that is clear. People adapt their smoking depending on the nature of the cigarette that they're smoking, so that at the bottom you can see a very strong relationship between the volume of smoke inhaled and the nicotine content of those, um, of those cigarettes, or those machine-read nicotine readings, I should say, um, on the, that you see on the pack. So this, the behaviour of a smoker is under very close biological control. And the reason that we're seeing this um, use of e-cigarettes is that it's the first time that we have a product which... Um, closely mimics this rapid delivery of nicotine in a way which also mimics the hand-to-mouth action and all of the other um, component parts of smoking behaviour that allow that very close self-titration. The question, though, is what is the impact of the constituents of the vapour on bystanders? And much of my interest in this comes from discussions I'm having with the University of Bristol at the moment around their smoking policy, which was expanded about a year ago to include e-cigarettes in a way that is often done by simply treating e-cigarettes as cigarettes and bundling them into the same one-size-fits-all um, policy so that smoking indoors is banned and vaping indoors is banned. What we're trying to do and what looks like we'll be um, successful in doing is introducing a more nuanced policy that creates a clear distinction between tobacco use and e-cigarette use to send out a message that if people are going to use nicotine then there are... Um, ways of doing so that are far preferable to smoking cigarettes. In terms of this concern around second-hand exposure, though, whether that be indoors or in closed spaces outside, much of it turns on this misunderstanding of the difference between being able to detect the presence of a chemical in vapour or the constituents of um, electronic cigarette liquid versus those levels being high enough to have a biological effect. Um, so here are some data which... Um, show the levels of these various constituents of tobacco products that are detectable within e-cigarettes, and in many cases they're below detectable limits, so less than one, for three different types of um, e-cigarette liquid. And in a few cases they're detectable at um, above that minimum threshold, but in all of those cases at levels far below what you see for a conventional cigarette, which is shown on the right. So the first point to make is that by being able to detect these constituents in electronic cigarette uh, vapour doesn't really tell us very much. What we need to be thinking about is the relative exposure compared to cigarette smoke, and then thinking about whether the detectable levels within e-cigarette vapour or e-cigarette liquid are actually likely to have biological effects. So one of the concerns has been around formaldehyde, for example. Um, and here we see some data from the same study on formaldehyde levels when three different um, e-cigarette liquids are consumed. You can see those three different e-cigarette liquids there. And then when a conventional cigarette is consumed. First of all, you can see this very dramatic spike when, e uh, when a conventional cigarette is smoked, because we know that very high levels of formaldehyde are generated by um, burnt tobacco. But the second point is that 
This gradual rise in formaldehyde levels as these three different e-cigarette liquids were consumed began before the first e-cigarette liquid was consumed and didn't seem to spike when those individual liquids were consumed. In other words, um, as the authors conclude, these elevated levels that we see before the first liquid is consumed suggests that the source of formaldehyde is internal metabolism, the breath of the volunteer, nothing actually directly to do with the e-cigarette liquid, um, when smoked or vaped, rather, under um, normal conditions. This is another study, um, which was uh, some data presented at um, the SRNT Europe annual meeting a couple of years ago. Smokers and vapors in a naturalistic setting, a hotel room 60 meters cubed on separate days, allowed to ad lib use their cigarette or e-cigarette. And again, what we have here for a cigarette are detectable and quite high levels of a range of um, chemicals that are known to have harmful effects. And then when we compare that against an e-cigarette, we can see that the levels are in pretty much all cases dramatically lower and often at the limits of detection. So again, the point is that we have very good technology for detecting very low levels of these constituents in cigarette smoke but also electronic cigarette vapour, but the, the ability to detect them doesn't mean that we should necessarily be concerned about health consequences. This is um, data shown again, just the total um, exposure count, if you like, the levels of um, those different constituents detectable over the course of that um, smoking or vaping period. You can see that there is a gradual rise in um, the detectable levels of these different co constituents when an electronic cigarette is used, but it's completely dwarfed by the levels that are achieved by smoking conventional tobacco cigarettes. So, we had a question earlier about the extent to which we need decades' worth of epidemiological data to be able to draw strong conclusions about the likely harms of um, electronic cigarettes relative to conventional cigarettes. Um, my argument would be that we have enough data from various sources to be able to triangulate very accurately to a conclusion which would suggest that whatever the level of non-zero harm may be, it will be orders of magnitude less than the known harms associated with tobacco smoke. We know how many deaths are attributable to smoking in the UK. We know how many deaths are attributable to passive smoking in the UK in the context of conventional tobacco cigarettes. We also know that the um, levels of exposure to the harmful constituents of tobacco smoke that are detectable in electronic cigarette vapour are consistently orders of magnitude lower than we see for conventional cigarettes. And therefore, by extrapolation, exposure due to active vaping is going to be much, much less harmful than exposure to active smoking. And I don't think that, that shouldn't, in my mind, be a controversial conclusion because we have enough evidence to be able to essentially join the dots and see that um, that would be a very likely consequence of what we already know. And that while we do need to continue to collect data to just confirm that that uh, conclusion is correct as um, evidence develops, I don't think that should prevent us from acting now. And the arguments that I've had with the um, health and safety people at the University of Bristol have been very interesting because once this evidence was presented to them, they were very keen in the context of promoting a healthy environment and discouraging staff at the University of Bristol from smoking to create a clear distinction between smoking and electronic cigarettes so that electronic cigarette use could be permitted in certain locations, probably not indoors, principally because people working in shared offices might not like um, the, the clouds of vapour and the smells and so on that, that would uh, come with vaping, in the same way that they wouldn't necessarily um, be particularly grateful if you started eating really smelly food at your desk, for example. Um, so there's a courtesy issue, which I think is valid. But in terms of sending out a clear message, distinguishing between smoking and vaping is extremely important in these workplace policies. Thank you. Nice to be here. Marcus and I are used to doing a double act. He does the science and I do the policy. So I'm going to shift to uh, that next. If I can get the slide to move on. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. Um, the first one is the arguments that are used to regulate the use of e-cigarettes in enclosed public spaces and the evidence so far. So I'm going to build on what Marcus has already said, but talk more about the values, beliefs, and some of the evidence we have to underpin that. First of all, harm to bystanders. I'll add to what Marcus has said. Then the arguments around why enforcement is difficult. Then what we call renormalization or normalization, the issues of etiquette. And then I'll show you a really interesting study on how public opinion may affect what regulators do on e-cigarette use in enclosed public places. <laughs> 
So we've heard from Marcus about some of the evidence on the constituents of e-cigarette vapour and, and do they pose a health risk to bystanders and it's clearly far less than tobacco. But there's also data on air quality, which is a different source of, uh, of data and evidence. There are still very few studies and in fact I'd like to see more studies on this and we could benefit from um, more research that looks at this issue. But here we're really talking about are uh, bystanders exposed to the, the particulate matter that you would get from tobacco smoke when they're exposed to, uh, to secondhand vapour. And here we really have two studies, one from Maciek Gonowicz and colleagues that looks at uh, PM 2.5 levels in people who were vaping or, or smoking. And then m many of you will have read the recent study, a very small study in Spain that compared um, households where you had a smoker a non-smoker and an e-cigarette user. And what seems to be coming through is that PM 2.5 levels from e-cigarette vapour are similar to that of a non-smoking environment. They're very low. Uh, they're still detectable, but they're low. And when you compare that with cigarette smoke, where we know that particulate matter is harmful, particularly to lung health, we can be relatively <laughs> confident that we're not, people are not exposed to the same level of harm. But what about enforcement? So the areas I work in, I often hear from my environmental health colleagues and others that enforcing uh, smoke-free legislation in UK contexts has become more difficult because of e-cigarettes. And I've just chosen here one typical example from a city council in England who say many e-cigarettes look exactly like cigarettes. It would be difficult for staff to be able to tell the difference between a real and an e-cigarette and enforcing no smoking legislation. And that's the reason that they're banned in many places. And that's a classic uh, argument that's put forward and you see that being played out across the world. So are these devices undermining our smoke-free legislation? So there are certainly examples of enforcement problems and I've talked to officers who have given those and that, that is particularly the case in Scotland and as you know we have a very live debate in Wales at the moment. But in England here in particular we've seen real efforts to call for balance <coughs> And Ash, Deborah's colleagues and others were responsible for bringing many of us together to create a decision document, encouraging organizations to ask questions before they decided to introduce a blanket ban on e-cigarettes in all public places. And there are more recent developments here and also in Scotland. But very encouragingly, is Ian here? Ian Gray, are you here? Not yet, okay. Ian is uh, the principal policy officer from the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health. And a number of weeks ago, and this is our main UK, uh, England and Wales uh, environmental health organization, these are the staff who are responsible for enforcing smoke-free legislation. They approved a policy statement on permitting or prohibiting use of e-cigarettes in indoor workplaces and public places. And it contains six statement, statements that are not supportive of blanket bans on e-cigarette use in all enclosed public places. And I'll just take you through these because these are important as international examples. They're important for the debates we have in the devolved nations. And what they say is similar to what Marcus has just said around university environments. Regulation and policy needs to make a clear distinction between vaping and smoking. And in my experience, we're failing to do that in many cases. Statutory prohibitions on the use of nicotine vaporizers in public places would not be justified on the grounds of passive exposure, as we've heard. And compliance with these smoke-free requirements can be maintained and supported by emphasizing this clear distinction and also indicating areas, as we have today, for example, where vaping is permitted or not prohibited and talking to uh, employees and others very clearly about what, why that is the case. So I think that's positive and I hope colleagues will be able to use the CIEH statements in some of their work. What about renormalization? So I'm not going to talk about this in any depth because Deborah is going to give you a very clear presentation in a moment about children and e-cigarette use in the UK. So here are the arguments. E-cigarette use mimics smoking and therefore it encourages tobacco use. These products will undermine years of reductions in smoking rates. Children who would never otherwise have used tobacco will start doing so after e using e-cigarettes. Uh, we are tracking all the studies on electronic cigarettes. We produce a monthly bulletin. We're engaged in systematic reviews, as many colleagues are. I have yet to see a single piece of evidence that persuades me that these phenomena are currently happening. So I wait. I wait to see. Finally, what about etiquette? So a final reason for prohibiting use is preference or etiquette, and some would argue that we shouldn't release anything into the ambient air which isn't essential. 
So this is a decision for individual users and for businesses, and we need to continue with that. And my final slides, Anne, very briefly, are on public opinion. So um, I just want to show you in, in conclusion one recent study that looked at surveying adults in the US about their views on banning e-cigarettes and their perceptions of harm to health from secondhand vapor. And what they found was that adults in the US overall thought that secondhand vapor was harmful to health um, and that they uh, supported the restrictions of uh, use on e-cigarettes indoors in restaurants, uh, in bars, casinos and clubs and even in some of them in parks. But the important thing is those who believe that e-cigarette vapour was harmful were more likely to support restrictions on indoor use. And that means that it's our responsibility to continue to convey clearly what the evidence says. Harm perceptions influence support for restrictions and we know that harm perceptions on e-cigarettes, as we're going to hear later, are generally moving in the wrong direction. So better evidence-based information is needed not just for policymakers but also for the public if sensible and proportionate policy is to be made. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Andrew and Mark. We've got time for one question. Sorry, Isaac Ojo from uh, Sandra Public Health. It seems to me that we've not been able to say categorically that exposure to the particulate matters from e-cigarettes is not harmful to a bystander. Now, in view of that, because to a user of e-cigarette, it's okay to know that it's less harmful than a conventional cigarette smoking. However, to a bystander who doesn't use e-cigarette, I think what that person will want to know is that at whatever level the particulate matters are, that it's not going to harm him. And in the absence of that assurance, does it not make sense to restrict exposure? So let's start. If you use that argument, there would be many other things that we would restrict or ban use of in indoor spaces. Air fresheners, other things that actually uh, contribute to things in the air. Um, there may be other examples, scented candles, all kinds of things that, that influence the ambient air. But you're absolutely right. We're not saying that there is no PM 2.5. There are no constituents in vapour. And as I said, people may prefer to have nothing in the air if they can, if they can uh, apply that. But the key issue for me is the comparison with tobacco. If we say that we are banning e-cigarette use everywhere indoors and in public places, it sends the message to the public that the vapour is just like tobacco smoke. And that's, I think, the key message in terms of the evidence we've tried to present. Yeah, I just reinforce that point that um, zero risk is um, unachievable in any aspect of our lives. And so we shouldn't be focusing on that because it's simply irrelevant in the sense that I probably expose myself to far more harmful constituents walking from Piccadilly Tube Station down here today than I would by standing next to a vapour. There are um, particles all around us, indoors, outdoors, when we walk down the street, and we can't control all of those. What's most important in the current context, and in particular given the number of deaths associated with tobacco use, is sending out a clear message that the two are not the same. So, for example, at Bristol, this policy that we've been discussing um, will not be one that's very closely enforced in terms of banning um, smoking on um, university premises because there are difficulties in doing that. What's most important about the policy is that it shows um, a clear appreciation of the difference between smoking and vaping and encourages one over the other. Okay, yes. Um, uh, I, I mean, basically, it's not a question but a clarification. The clarification is that we're talking about particulate matter 2.5 or 1 or whatever, but uh, we are not talking about what these particles are. There is a big difference between particulate matter in the environmental pollution coming from tobacco cigarettes and particles. The cigarette is micro droplets of basically propylene glycol, glycerol, and water. You cannot compare the, 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 just the numbers without discussing about the content of these particles. So uh, basically, it's going to be very hard to prove that this particulate matter has any effect. Because these are not combustion particles like present in cigarette smoke or coming from the environmental pollution. Uh, let me tell you that the smallest particles available uh, are just by boiling water. So steam has the smallest particles. 
this doesn't mean that steam is going to go uh, this is I mean, I think this just links back to the point about the difference between something being detectable and something being biologically active, and that's a really critical distinction. And it's worth pointing out that there are something like 9,000 deaths per year in London alone from air pollution. E-cigarettes are not going to contribute anything de detectable to that kind of um, exposure, so it's on a completely different scale. Super. Thank you very much again, both of you.